I'd like to introduce the EFF panel. This is the Ask the EFF panel. You get to ask some of the premier legal minds devoted to making sure your ass doesn't end up in jail questions. So I'm going to hand it off to Kurt Opsahl and let him introduce his panelists. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's so great to see so many people here today. Uh, how many of you are already familiar with the EFF? Yeah. All right. That's a good number of hands. Thank you, guys. Thank you for following our issues. Uh, so I will make only the briefest uh, of descriptions for, for those who haven't. Uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, we are a nonprofit civil liberties organization dedicated to defending your rights online for fair use, for privacy, for innovation. Uh, and we want to make sure that the future is one we'd want to live in. One of the things that we do uh, a lot here is we provide uh, free legal advice to, uh, to speakers and security researchers who need that. Uh, and we're here today to answer your questions. Uh, we'll start out by giving brief introductions to, from my uh, co-panelists here, so you can see what sort of work that we do, uh, give you some ideas about questions to ask. Uh, one uh, ground rule, very important, as we do uh, provide legal advice, and we, we often have uh, had members of this community become our clients, but this is not the place to ask legal advice. <laughs> you want to have an attorney-client privilege conversation, which is confidential, uh, when you're explaining the things that you might have done that you're worried about. And uh, when you're doing it in front of like you know, several hundred people, that is not the right place for it. So if you have those sorts of questions, save them for later. Come find us after. Write to uh, info at EFF.org. Uh, and our intake coordinator can, can help you uh, uh, get in touch with the right people. But uh, for these questions, any other topics about, uh, about what we do, we'd love to hear them. So let's start out and have our panels introduce themselves. Hi there. My name is Eva Galperin, and I'm a global policy analyst with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I work on EFF's international team, meaning that uh, while we have uh, many employees at EFF whose job it is to worry about U.S. law and U.S. surveillance, and sort of US persons. Um, my team worries about the rest of the world. So we're a little busy, we don't sleep much. Um, primarily I work on, um, my, my work is focused on vulnerable populations, which means usually journalists and dissidents and, uh, and activists. I work on uh, privacy, surveillance, security, and free speech issues. Um, you can ask me about sort of the security and privacy advice that EFF is giving, the kind of trainings that we're doing with uh, people in Ethiopia and Vietnam. Um, I am uh, also particularly interested in the post-Soviet states. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on with surveillance right now in the UK and in Australia. Um, I am also available to answer various questions about sort of um, how EFF views security research because I have published a great deal of security research with EFF and um, also in collaboration with Citizen Lab. So um, having said that, here's Jan. Hey, I'm Jan. Um, I'm a staff technologist at EFF, which is a really vague title, but uh, I maintain a browser extension called HTTPS Everywhere with the Tor project. Um, wow, thank you. Cool, yeah. Uh, making a new release when I get back on Monday. Um, I also make a browser extension called Privacy Badger. Um, that's an ad blocker. You guys really like browser extensions. Okay, I'm not done yet. Get this. Um, and what else do I do? Um, we have a new mail encryption project called Star TLS Everywhere, which I've spoken about here a little bit. Um, in general, my work is on uh, focused on how do we protect people's privacy from uh, advertisers and governments and so forth, and also how do we get um, people who run servers to turn on encryption as much as they can. So you can ask me anything. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm Mark Jaycox. I'm a legislative analyst with EFF, um, where I help to get our message to Congress, talk to lawmakers, and work. And depending on the congressman or congresswoman, argue with their staffers about what they're doing, what they're trying to do, um, and how their legislation will impact tech. Uh, my main issues, the issues I work on, deal a lot with national security uh, issues, surveillance law, the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, and kind of a lot of the surveillance privacy laws. Hey, I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I'm on the civil liberties team, so I do free speech and privacy, and I work with Kurt on the Coder's Rights Project. Uh, we represent hackers and security researchers and academics um, 
to try and keep them out of trouble and get them out of trouble. Uh, we, we do in fact counsel uh, people who present at conferences just like this to make sure that they don't um, say anything that they will regret in front of a room full of feds. Uh, I work on, I don't really work on the national security cases that we do. Uh, right now I'm suing the government of Ethiopia for wiretapping an American citizen on American soil using a targeted malware program called Finn Fisher. Uh, if the Finn Fisher guys are here, tell them I say hi. Um, <laughs> I work on some automotive privacy issues because I like cars. Um, I do Freedom of Information Act litigation as well and right now along with our legal fellow Andrew Crocker who is not here, I am suing uh, the NSA and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to get them to fork over documents about the so-called vulnerabilities equities process. This is uh, the, the balancing test that the government uses to decide whether or not to sit on zero days. Um, and we want to know what that process is because they haven't told anybody. And so we FOIA'd it and of course they didn't respond so we sued. That's what I do. And so as I said, I'm, I'm Kurt Opsall. I'm another one of the attorneys at EFF. Uh, and so let me just tell you about a couple other pieces of, of litigation that we work on that you guys might have questions about. Uh, we have a couple of active suits against the uh, National Security Agency for the warrantless wiretapping program, trying to put a halt to the unconstitutional legal uh, telephone records program and the upstream uh, uh, wiretapping program. I also am working on a case against uh, uh, national security letters. These are letters that the FBI can issue to service providers without a court, without any process, uh, to obtain information about their customers. And if they get one, the service providers aren't allowed to tell anybody. Even the fact that they have received one, uh, we got a court to declare that was unconstitutional last year. And, right? And so the government has appealed and we are defending that appeal so argument will be in early October and we'll go explain to the appeals court why that's not right and shouldn't be allowed. Uh, we also work on some intellectual property issues. Uh, I can probably uh, answer some of your copyright questions if they, if they come up. Uh, and uh, I guess with that, let's, uh, let's start this up with the questions. Sir. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yep. My name is Don Nindale. I'm CEO of a Nevada corporation. I have two patents on security. They deal with encryption. Because of that, about three years ago, I got a card from one of the ACLU panelists. And I want to ask, do you compliment? Do you work with uh, ACLU? Uh, what I'm thinking about is maybe I need a card from one of you also because <laughs> If I'm in encryption, you know exactly who's looking at it and why I'm a person of interest. Is it possible to be able to, to, to get a card like this after, uh, in, a, in a private session? Because I, I think someday that they're going to be, they're going to be right here uh, standing beside me, you know, and yanking me off. Uh, do you understand my question? Do you, All right, do you so work? I think the question is, is how do we work together with our yeah, friends at yeah. the ACLU? Do you complement each other? Do you, do you coordinate? Do you work? Uh, side by side, and and which one of you would be the best one for me to to uh, consult with in the event that no such agency? Oh, I didn't, I'm not supposed to mention that. All right. And the second part of the question was, what do you do? How do you get assistance from from EFF when you find yourself in yeah. legal hot water? Some, something something like that. Yeah. So let me uh, address, I guess, uh, uh, the first question first. Uh, and uh, we work together very closely with the ACLU. Uh, for example, uh, one, one case that uh, we're working on about uh, the 215 records program, we are co-counseling with the ACLU, uh, and so that's, that's a pretty uh, tight relationship. We have been uh, amicus, which is, so in court cases, uh, in addition to the parties, you can come in as an amicus, that's a friend of the court, to provide some additional views to the court from uh, your community. So uh, we've often done this in ACLU cases, they've often done that in our cases. So I think we have actually a very good relationship with them and do complement each other. Uh, and then I think the second part of the question was uh, how, to, uh, how to get assistance from EFF. Uh, so actually on this panel we have two former intake coordinators. They have now gone on to other jobs at EFF. But do you, one of you guys want to talk about that process a little bit? I can do it. Um, so 
Uh, if you would like EFF to help you in some way, if you are looking for legal assistance, the thing to do is to email info at EFF.org. At the other end of that email address is a very nice man named Amul, whose job it is to patiently talk to everybody who wants EFF's help, um, figure out whether or not this is the sort of case that EFF would like to take on, and if that's the case, put them in touch with an EFF attorney. Um, if it is not an EFF case, his job does not end there. Uh, the next step is uh, to put this person either in touch with other resources, uh, especially if this is sort of not an EFF-like issue, um, or to put them in touch with our list of cooperating attorneys. We maintain a list of several hundred attorneys across the country, all of whom are interested in doing pro bono cases and sometimes, you know, sort of uh, semi-pro bono kind of um, discount cases. Um, that come EFF's way uh, and who can also provide you with legal assistance. So what we do is we, uh, we send an email out to that list and if somebody responds, we go ahead and we put you in touch with them. So uh, Jan, I was wondering if you could describe HTTP Nowhere for the folks in the room and, and, and where that, you know, the implications of building that into tails and stuff like that. And, uh, and another question is, uh, could you guys talk about the Riley case and the implications for hackers in the room, uh, how things might have changed? The implications of which case? Riley. If uh, you want to. You don't cell have phone to. tracking, or yeah. sorry, cell phone search. Case. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay, I guess uh, since you asked the first part of the question to me, I should answer it. Um, how many people here use HTTPS everywhere? Okay, so real, really quickly what it is is a browser extension that will uh, automatically make the HTTPS connection to a website when you visit it if we know that that server supports HTTPS and things are like unlikely to break if we switch you over to SSL. So this prevents uh, like SSL strip attacks which Moxie has presented on in the past and also sometimes you know like Reddit for instance doesn't really like uh, until recently, you had to go to pay.reddit.com to get the SSL version, and so we auto we have that automatically in a browser extension. So um, it, it's pretty good. We have like 10,000 sites or so in the development version right now, maybe like 4,000 stable. Um, so lately, a lot of people have been saying like uh, uh, with all these NSA attacks and all these like privacy concerns, um, HTTPS everywhere is not good enough. What you actually want is uh, like a hardened browser mode where you don't have any uh, clear text traffic. So what if you could just uh, like say only use HTTP never, or sorry only use HTTPS never, never go to HTTP. Um, and so this is actually pretty easy to do from within HTTPS everywhere. So now if you use the development version of HTTPS everywhere you can experiment with this mode called HTTP nowhere mode where it just like blocks all HTTP traffic. Um, and uh, I have to do some weird things like it turns off OCSP for a little bit because otherwise you'll get SSL errors all the time. Um, so yeah, like I'd love feedback on that and stuff like that. So. All right. And the second part of the question was asking about the, uh, the Riley case, which was a recent decision by the United States Supreme Court uh, dealing with the search of a smartphone. Uh, and the court found 9-0 uh, that you needed to have a warrant to get this information. This is a really good decision. Not only is it a good decision because this means that the governor needs to get a warrant on your cell phone if you get uh, arrested, that's good enough in itself, but it helps establish precedent for other cases. The discussion uh, in that case has a lot of really good language that is going to end up in briefs uh, for years to come where the, the court was saying that your whole life is in your phone, that it matters uh, to protect this information uh, and that they, the government's argument that, uh, well, you know, basically as technology made things easier to have on your person, we should sort of treat this like just whatever happened to be in your pocket. Ordinarily they can look in your pockets when there's a search incident to arrest. And so they wanted to have that the, the effect of new technology be an expansion of police powers to search. So that they would then be able to get anything which happened to be in your pocket all the way into the phone and potentially into any uh, server side information that was accessible to that phone. Uh, and the Supreme Court rejected that theory. It rejected their theory that because these phones were connected to servers elsewhere that the, uh, you had given up your privacy rights in them because you had communicated that information to third parties. The government said, therefore, you didn't care about this information, should be free reign, no warrant needed. The court rejected that. The government said, well, we will put forth some 
regulations and, and rules that will make sure that this happens in a very orderly and nice manner. And the court said, our founders didn't fight a revolution to have government regulations and rules. Uh, and it, this, is, this is language 9-0, right? So if, if you guys uh, read our briefs in the, in the years to come, I think you're going to see a lot of quotes from the Riley decision, and we're going to try and make that precedent stick all over on Fourth Amendment issues. Hi, I'm Andrew Conway. I'm a researcher for CloudMark. Um, I'd actually be interested in, in a comment from each member of the panel on this one. Uh, what do you think the best and worst things uh, that have happened in the past year from the point of view of your particular work for the EFF? Mm -hmm. Awesome question. All right, well, we're hitting the whole panel. We'll right. keep it very, very brief. Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll start out with some of the best and the worst things. It's, it's the same thing, which is the <laughs> revelations that we have learned about, uh, the additional information we have learned about NSA surveillance. It's the best thing because we now have much more information about it. It helps us uh, fight our lawsuits against the NSA. It helps uh, make people aware of what's going on and the need to stop it. It's the worst thing because, oh my God, they're doing an amazing amount of surveillance on us in contravention of our constitutional rights. I'm, I'm going to take a very similar approach, uh, which is that I'm going to talk about a different leak, which happened uh, just uh, last week and earlier this week. Uh, there was a, a hacker who goes by the name of Phineas Fisher who uh, broke into who broke into Gamma. Are we? All right. So there, was a, there was a hacker who broke into, uh, broke into Gamma, uh, which is a company which makes a product called uh, FinFisher and FinSpy. Uh, they went ahead and uh, pulled a bunch of their uh, brochures and um, also a whole lot of, uh, of other documentation and uh, some of their source code and put it all online. Uh, one of the most interesting revelations that has come about as a result of, of this particular hack is uh, confirmation of a lot of the work that Citizen Lab has been doing over the last couple of years um, about the fact that this company, which is based in the UK and Germany, um, is selling its uh, surveillance equipment to governments that are using it uh, for very shady purposes. We're using it to spy on activists and journalists and uh, possibly committing human rights abuses. So it's, uh, it's really get, great to get sort of a confirmation about the stuff that, that we have been suspecting for several years. Um, the bad news, I think the worst thing that I've really seen um, this year is a lot of security and privacy burnout. Um, I talk to um, journalists and activists all over the world and uh, I watch them succumb to privacy nihilism. They read things like the, the Finn Fisher hack or um, they look at the NSA uh, documents and they say, well, the government knows how to get to everything all the time anyway, so why should I bother protecting my privacy and security at all? And uh, this is really one of those, uh, one of the most important fights that we need to fight um, on the world stage, which is uh, getting people the technical information they need to understand that when you simply give up on protecting your privacy and security, you are letting the bad guys win. Governments want you to think that they are all powerful and that they see everything all the time because if you don't do anything, you make that work trivial. And there are a couple of things that you can do that will make their job hard. That is a difficult answer to follow up. So I'm just going to say something really boring, which is that SSL usage is actually up quite significantly. Uh, so there was a report that stated, like, in some parts of the world, like Latin America, um, peak traffic uh, percentage of that that is encrypted has gone from about 1% or 2% to about 10%. It's amazing. Um, and it's up largely because major service providers have been turning on SSL and there's more of that to come. So Cloudflare has said free SSL for all customers by very soon. And WordPress has said uh, we're turning on SSL for everyone in the next year. That's a lot of sites. So we're doing, we're doing okay on that front. Um, 
of the bad things that happened this year was Heartbleed. Um, I think it was really demoralizing to a lot of people. And we, uh, as the maintainer of HTTPS everywhere, actually noticed some sites starting to break after Heartbleed because their operators said, we're just not going to use SSL now. We're going to turn it off. And that's, that's really sad. Uh, so you know what? It is very rough out there, but you know, give <laughs> a little comfort to everybody, a little bit of tradition. <laughs> <laughs> what we could all use right now is something that we all know and love, which is welcoming yeah, new speakers. <laughs> I know not everybody's up here is, is new. Some of you have spoken before. Please raise your hand if you are a new speaker at DEF CON. All right. Most of new speakers. I'll still take a drink. Cheers. 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 Congratulations. Cheers. 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 Ooh, that was good, too. I'm awake now. <laughs> <laughs> and now back to your regularly scheduled mayhem. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, I have to take a similar approach to Kurt. I mean, I think the worst things are is really the information we've had you know, from Stone and from the leakers. Um, I think the best thing, though, I will take is um, part of the educational aspects, right? The public, larger public, non tech people are becoming a lot more aware of what they share, who they share with, and their behavior is changing. Um, they're learning what a third party is, right, and where their information is potentially going um, to all these data brokers and other third parties. And at least in, you know, particularly in my area, especially working on the legislative side and with Congress, um, it's members of Congress actually getting educated on these things, right? We've seen members of Congress outraged that they were not properly briefed on this stuff and completely outraged that they had a, a right to know they should have been informed and they weren't in some instances. Um, and so that is, has a huge impact on where Congress is moving with this stuff, gaining a base understanding of the complexity of these systems, um, the complexity of what the NSA, what government intelligence agencies are collecting. And so those are really some of the two most important aspects on my book. I mean, you have a clear response which was increased education from the public and from members of Congress and that provides a base level, right? It provides a foundation to understanding the systems and it provides a foundation to reorienting your actions towards a more privacy friendly, towards a more tech friendly uh, environment and in particular when it comes to lawmakers, legislation and smart legislation and actually thoughtful legislation. Um. So one of the projects that I work on at EFF is our Who Has Your Back report. Uh, this is the report where we give gold stars to companies uh, that have good practices in protecting user data. Um, companies are little children and they respond very well to being offered gold stars. Um, this, is, this year was our fourth year, fourth? Fourth year fourth, yeah. of Who Has Your Back. Um, and the best thing that we saw this year, far and away, is companies al almost down the line with the big internet service providers, um, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, uh, are promising to give notice to users when the government comes seeking their data, uh, unless they're gagged. That is just extraordinarily important. If, if a company gives notice to the user when, when the government comes seeking their data, that means the user can fight back. They can contact info at EFF.org. We can move to quash the process. Uh, and if the company doesn't give notice, no one can fight because the company is not going to do it. Uh, and we've seen in the last year uh, that column on our Who Has Your Back report just fill with stars and it's awesome. Um, so, and, and that frankly is a direct result of the Snowden leaks. The companies had egg on their face uh, with that beautiful prism slide that we saw on August 6th of last year. Um, so they needed to do something, or June, June 6th. Uh, they needed to do something and they are and that's great. Um, I think the worst thing that I've seen this year is uh, CFAA reform is stalled in Congress. It's not moving and it needs to move. Uh, after our, our friend Aaron Schwartz's uh, tragic death, um, there was some momentum behind it and now it's not moving. And that sucks and it needs to change. All right. Uh, <coughs> so, so when I receive an email with a GPG signature, it's really reassuring that I know that the email comes from the person I want it from. Uh, is a GPG signature generally considered evidence in court that an email came from a place and alternately a lack of a GPG signature, can that be used as evidence that an email didn't come from someone asking for a friend? 
Uh, as to the second part of the question, I don't think anyone's ever tried it. Uh, as to the first part of the question, you would need expert testimony to support that. Um, but sure, I mean, it, it helps establish chain of custody. It helps establish authentication. Uh, it's not forged. Um, my GPG fingerprint is on my business card, and I encourage all of you to do the same thing, um, so that I know that it's actually your GPG signature. Um, anyway, yeah. Can I can I ask a quick follow up, which is weird because I'm on the panel, <laughs> uh, but I thought that was a great question. So uh, conversely, um, you know, so what's that? Get in line. <laughs> <laughs> So conversely, uh, people say OTR is great because it has plausible deniability. Um, do, you, do you think that would hold up in court as evidence that someone didn't say something if um, the other party turns over their chat logs? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Mayb maybe. Okay. No answer. <laughs> Question on I'm a lawyer. The answer is it depends. Well, it's complicated. <laughs> Deniability and non-repudiation are two different things. So, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys for what you do. Um, Thanks, sir. What kind of expectation of privacy do employees have from next generation firewalls that are doing HTTPS inspection? And as an administrator, one of those. Could you please speak loud? And slow down too a little bit. Sorry. Um, what kind of expectation of privacy do employees have from next generation firewalls that are doing HTTPS inspection? in their uh, workplace. And as an administrator of one of those firewalls, is there anything legal that an admin would need to know about running one of those? All right. Um, I'll, I'll take the first part of this question. Um, most of you, when you come to work for a company, among the very large pile of documents that you sign, one of them essentially says that anything they do to you on their network is nice and legal and you say it's okay. And that includes uh, intercepting your encrypted, uh, your encrypted chats on their network, uh, man in the middle of them and reading them. Uh, networks such as Apple have been doing this for years um, on, the, on the theory that this will help them catch leakers. Um, so if you have given up your rights, you have given up your rights. Um, so that answers the first part of the question. Whether or not there is any culpability on the part of the network administrators, I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, but again, if the, uh, if the employee has already signed a document saying anything that you do to me on the network is nice and legal, you don't, I don't think that you have any culpability. Yeah, so I, I would just uh, add a little bit to that as, because as, as a lawyer, I got to add in the it depends. So there are, are circumstances sometimes where they don't put the things in the employee manual, what it says in the manual and how detailed it is. There are cases from time to time in which somebody has been able to say what they've done was actually not part of what I gave consent to in the employee manual. And under some circumstances for uh, government employers, if you're trying to, uh, you know, you may have some additional rights. So under particular circumstances, it could happen. Uh, and so. Uh, if there's something where it's a concrete example and there's a real question, that'd be the sort of thing to get sort of specific advice about that particular situation. With your encrypted email initiative, what is your technical goals? And are you working with any uh, anyone else that's also working on the same sort of problems like dark mail? Like, what was the last word you said? Are you working with other people who are also trying to solve encrypted email, like dark mail or or anything like? Right. Uh, so the question was, what's our encrypted email initiative? Um, so which, uh, which makes me, the way you asked that makes me think that I was kind of misleading in my introduction. So our, our, our encrypted email project is for server-to-server -server transit encryption, not end-to-end, -end, uh, like, you, like you encrypting an email to the other person, which is um, what PGP, a lot of people use PGP for. So our uh, encrypted email project, Start TLS Everywhere, is to make um, TLS connections between SMTP servers more robust. Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually what you wanted to hear about, so I'm just going to stop talking. But if you do, <laughs> then ask, someone else should ask me that question. Yeah. Hi, um, my name's Ethan. I'm a 3L at UCLA, um, and I really appreciate your work. Um, historically, when you look at a lot of the civil rights battles, they've been done very strategically. An organization will have a very clearly defined goal, be it gay marriage or desegregation, and then go about achieving that goal very strategically through test cases and being very selective. 
Do you have any macro goal like that with corresponding strategy, or are you more of a attack everywhere mentality? We absolutely <laughs> cannot attack everywhere. We actually are, are you know, we, we have about 50 people in the organization, uh, and uh, that, that our bandwidth is constantly filled with being able to uh, work on perhaps just a small percentage of the cases. So we definitely try to be strategic about it. One of the things that happens with our intake coordinator, we are talking about that process before, is trying to determine whether to take a case to see if it can be done within our bandwidth and also accomplish some goals. Try and set precedent, try and do something which is going to have a greater effect than just on, on the parties involved uh, and try and push things forward. And you know, there, there are things which are overarching goals. We want to support fair use, so we take some cases which will help uh, solidify the fair use doctrine. We want to determine that uh, well, the, the third party doctrine is, uh, uh, is bunk. Third party doctrine is this notion that uh, you lose your Fourth Amendment rights if you store information with a third party. Uh, and then uh, this, this was brought about uh, in, the, uh, in the late 70s. Uh, nowadays, with more and more information going online, it's a very dangerous doctrine. And we're trying to find uh, uh, the right cases to, uh, to undermine that, to uh, come up with a better doctrine for dealing with information in the digital age. So yeah, we do operate very strategically. Yeah, I, I would also add that we also have you know annual meetings where we think about hard and seriously what we have done for in the past year. At least you know I'm speaking for the legal team now, president wise, and each team does this. But thinking about if, you know for the year, what have we done in the past, and really what do we want to do in the next few years? You know, three, five, seven years. Um, so there's a lot of long-term thinking. There's a lot of you know, figuring out where our best, where our resources are best served, um, and that long-term thinking, I think, you know, is very important to figuring out where we spend our resources, what what we want to do, what we need to do, um, and a lot of it, you know, we get from talking with you guys. Um, I'll give a concrete example. Uh, the Ethiopia case that I'm working on, that I actually should be writing in opposition to a motion to dismiss right now, but instead I'm talking to you. Um, we we took that case, so it. it our client is an, an Ethiopian American. He's a U.S. citizen. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. Charming man. Um, but we took that case not just because what the Ethiopian government did to him sucks. We took the case because we want to establish the precedent that governments can't just spy on people willy-nilly without going through legal process, um, which is exactly what the Ethiopian government did to our guy. And if we can get an American court to say illegal spying is illegal and you can't do it, that's valuable, not just for our client, but for everybody. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a window into the type of thinking that, that we do before we take a case. So, my question is more about turning to the offensive. Uh, I'm a malware researcher, and I've come across many times where a botnet or a ransomware command and control server is vulnerable itself. If I was to, say, attack that server with the end goal to shut down the botnet or disable the malware network, what legal ramifications are there? And is it even an option, right? It, I'm it sick depends. of taking it. I want to dish some back. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> and it depends. For, for a question about your particular situation, that's probably one that we should be taking o offline and having a uh, private case. Legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll spin on that question a little bit. Microsoft did something really interesting a couple of weeks ago. They uh, they discovered a botnet that they didn't like at all um, that was using noip.org, the dynamic DNS service, uh, for its command and control structure, which I think is actually a pretty clever idea, but, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to take it out and they were going to take it out by suing noip. And they did. Uh, and they got the, the registries to turn over control of the name servers to Microsoft. And as a result, they put 5 million innocent uh, dynamic DNS subscribers out of service for like four days. Um, that's not the way to do it, buddy. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Mostly out of <laughs> Hi, my name is Sean. Um, with the Supreme, Supreme Court of the United States weighing in a lot of these issues where we have, uh, you know, crash course uh, in technology. Um, uh, for the, the justices, um, obviously there's different ways that they can get things wrong, depending on your perspective, with regard to legal and philosophical matters. Um, but it seems to me to, that it would be really bad if they get things wrong because of technical matters. Um, 
It seems to me that their lack of technological savvy represents a threat to them getting it right. I'd like to know if a, you guys agree. If so, to what magnitude do you think that risk is? And do you think there's any way to mitigate that risk? Uh, so this is actually something that has been involved with EFF for, for many years, which is explaining to judges about technology. And the judges, in order to be a judge, and you probably have to practice law for 20 or 30 years, uh, so you, you tend to be of a generation or two uh, beyond what the current technologies are. Uh, and this has been uh, one of the challenges, and we try to do this by explaining it well. We have our staff technologists who will help us out when we're writing our briefs, trying to explain in clear, plain English terms what these technologies are, use metaphors that the judges will understand, and try and improve it. Now, you may have seen uh, for some of the uh, decisions the last couple of years by the Supreme Court where they, they asked some questions which indicated that perhaps they weren't fully understanding the technology. Things like if you know a pager got two pages at the same time, would they get a busy signal? And this is about pager technology, which is you know already a generation behind. Uh, they had uh, uh, in, in, a, in a recent decision they talked a lot about the cloud. Some of them seemed to understand what that meant. Some of them may maybe not so much. But nevertheless, this is this is something which is very important. Uh, and one uh, a very important sort of saving grace, which I think has helped come up with some some good decisions out of judges. Uh, in recent eras is they all work with clerks and clerks are recent law school grads who are much more familiar with modern technology than the judges they work for and can help explain it to the judges and understand the briefs about it. Thank you. So I have another Riley question. I'm a graduate <laughs> student and I deal with human subjects data. I also have to go travel internationally a lot. Does Riley just protect my cell phone or does it also protect my laptop and tablet? And does it protect me at the border? All right. So let me hit that. Uh, the, the first question is, does Riley protect you beyond uh, the cell phone? So uh, just a, a little digression uh, about how sort of the precedent system works. Uh, so when you have a case decided, uh, what it means is just specific to the facts that are there. The case is about cell phones. But when you later have a case about a tablet or a laptop, you can say to the court, look, this is similar to a cell phone. This is something that is so similar to a cell phone because it operates in this manner. Because, like a smartphone, it can do these functions. It can make, you know, they, they can communicate just like a cell phone can. That you should come to the same conclusion for this new technology as you did with the old technology. And so, the cell phone decision forms a precedent, and then we were going to be using that precedent case by case to expand its scope so it hits these other areas. Uh, and then, uh, as far as uh, international borders. Um, your rights are much lessened at international borders. Coming in, they are able to uh, uh, do so. Instead of needing a warrant based on probable cause, they need reasonable suspicion, uh, which is a is a lower standard. Um, so you're suspicious. What? I just said you're suspicious. Very suspicious. Thank you. We're all suspicious. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, thanks. Oh, one more thing. Um, EFF has written a white paper about your rights at the border. Um, this is referred to as our border switch white paper. It was written by my colleagues uh, Seth Schoen and uh, Marsha Hoffman, who is now in private practice. Um, so if you would like more details about your rights at the border, um, just go ahead and take a look at that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. There's recently a technological innovation that uh, I see is expanding the scope of what can be accomplished through speech. It's called Bitcoin. And it allows a person to memorize a phrase and thereby travel, go here, go there, and keep secret with an arbitrarily large amount of money to communicate that phrase to another person through speech alone. And that person can then if they were to so choose, go use a computer to uh, get access to that money and give it to somebody else in the same way. So now that transmitting money and storing money is a form of speech, that wasn't true until four or five years ago, really. Uh, and the EFF have done cases uh, where people have encrypted tax records and, th and things like that. I mean, there's, there haven't there been some EFF cases already 
that look at the intersection between a person's right to privacy and free speech and finance. But now that the scope of that relationship is, is just being blown wide open, uh, why is, is EFF just staying out of that fight? And, and why is it, you know, why did they refuse Bitcoin donations? Why are we they... Take Bitcoin we take Bitcoin donations. We take Bitcoin, donations. Bitcoin now? Okay. Yeah, bring so that Bitcoin was, that was really booth. We'll, we'll take care of you. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> no, but where, where does that play out? Like the current regulatory uh, guidances from the IRS and FinCEN and, it, and New York Department of Financial Services mm -hmm. are just... Does the EFF even do regulatory law? Are they going to start doing regulatory law because of this intersection? Well, uh, let me clear up a little bit of confusion. Um, there was a brief period of time during which EFF stopped taking Bitcoin donations. And the reason why we did that was because we were not sure that it was legal for us to do so. And we needed the time to consult. Um, I, I actually want yeah. to make a right. modification on that. It's that there was some question about the legality, and what we like to do is be counsel for people and not be the defendants ourselves. Yes. Right? So we provide legal services to others who are in situations. And so this sometimes means that we are not the first actor on things because we want to be in a position to defend it. We didn't want to have a situation in which we're representing somebody who is using Bitcoin and the other side can say, well, you, you use Bitcoin yourself. You're not, you know, you're not a serious player here. You're just trying to defend your, your donation stream. And then after it came to, well, I'll let you finish the rest of the story, but I okay. wanted to interject that. All right. Um, we consulted with some trained legal professionals who have spent a lot of time uh, looking at the law of banking regulation. And once we felt that the chances of, of us ending up being um, the defendant in a lawsuit rather than somebody's lawyer, uh, we made another public announcement saying that, yes, we would in fact take Bitcoin. I actually think that Bitcoin is a very important technology, um, primarily because it is a very powerful tool in, uh, in the fight against uh, sort of limiting free speech by attacking its weakest link. Uh, which you definitely saw in the sort of U.S. attacks against, uh, against PayPal payments uh, to WikiLeaks. And so this is one of the reasons why we're ex especially excited about Bitcoin technology at EFF. Thank you for answering my question. No problem. Uh, my question is kind of threefold, um, and it all <laughs> pertains to... Uh, the blimp campaign at the Utah Data Center. We try to limit it to, to sort of the two-fold questions. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, fold, so fold folds two and three together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about one and two? Um, do you believe that you achieved your goals with that campaign, and what sort of backlash or repercussions have you had or challenges in uh, launching that campaign? Uh, sorry, how, which, campaign? Which, campaign? Which, which campaign? Yeah. The blimp campaign above the Utah Data Center. Oh, the blimp campaign. Okay. The weather was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay. I can I can speak on that for a little bit, and uh, anyone can jump into. You know, I think one of the major goals of that campaign will actually gets back to one of the be the best worst question, right? A big aspect of that came was increasing education around that, right? I mean, we know that a lot of you guys know about the NSA. It's really reaching out to the next step and reaching out to the general public, to the people who sometimes don't know what HTTPS is, right? Um, and so that campaign was a pretty huge educational campaign around that issue. Um, we saw massive hits around it, we saw massive sharing around it, and I think that was that is one of the main campaigns um, to increase education awareness about NSA spying, and especially around the bills in Congress too. Um, we released a scorecard, uh, a, a scorecard spy, or a scorecard uh, methodology around where senators and congressmen and congresswomen lawmakers rank, um, and that's stop the spying. Uh, org, and so that blimp campaign was part of that larger rollout to make sure that you know we pass strong reform that we fix you know at the minimum uh, one of these programs um, in the short term, and making sure that you know things get done. Uh, we've seen just crazy things over the past year and we need to fix a lot of them. And so it's pushing that envelope further and getting people to act, getting Congress to act, um, and increasing awareness around that. Thank you. You guys are great. Thank you for your courage. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the question I have is um, we've seen a lot of mob enthusiasm for net neutrality. And um, while I think that's great, I'm concerned when Congress makes bills about the internet. 
and I wanted to um, run a couple of lines from these bills by you. Um, in the uh, in the most recent bill, it says that uh, fixed broadband providers may not block lawful content, uh, application services, or non-harmful devices. Um, and then in the unreasonable discrimination, it also says fixed broadband providers may not unreasonably discriminate in transmitting lawful network traffic. It seems like by making those statements, they're also implying that they will have someone at these broadband providers watching to make sure everything is lawful in order to block unlawful content. Uh, I was just curious, what is your opinion on some of the, the recent net neutrality bills and do you guys have a congressman or two that maybe has a little more technical chops than some of the people in there that can have a voice in, in amending some of these bills and I'll, I'll listen online, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess the kind of my initial response is it's very hard to do a spot on legislative analysis right up on stage. Um, you know, I do <laughs> do do that sometimes, but it's probably a little bit hard. That that language sounds actually more like from uh, some of the computer security and cybersecurity bills than an actual net neutrality bill. Um, and then for the second part of your question, I guess I'd take, st take a step back a little bit because right now, we hear a lot of rumblings, right, that Congress is going to do something on net neutrality, or not even do something, but there are bills in Congress about net neutrality, and that does not equate to Congress doing something on net neutrality, right? We have, we have a lot of PR bills released. We have a lot of bills that are there for a press release splash and to make news. Um, you know, right now, net neutrality is really uh, in the regulatory phase and they're trying to figure that out, right? We had over a million comments filed on the net neutrality and where it's going on net neutrality, reclassification, and kind of where the public is at and where the FCC is at. Um, so Congress right now I think is watching, but uh, Congress is, I, I don't really think Congress is going to be passing anything straight up on net neutrality. I think the, the important aspect and, you know, especially what you've seen EFF focus on in our resources is around the FCC, the comment system, um, and community Wi-Fi and getting those things out there. Um, so we'll see. You know, Congress, as they want to, sometimes they react quickly and th will throw something on the, on the floor or try and move something. But right now, net neutrality is really in the regulatory aspect and, and we're trying to hammer it down there and, and get our opinions and our thoughts out there. All right. Um, what is the, I guess, current state of case law around MC catchers or stingrays and what can we do to change that case law so that it's not as god awfully scary as it was last I looked? Mm -hmm. Nate, you want to um, I'm actually not sure of the answer to that question. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we're doing around MC catchers is we're filing a bunch of FOIA lawsuits uh, to try and get municipalities and agencies to fork over the records of when they use MC catchers. Um, we think they use them a whole lot more than they admit to, so we're trying to do that. Um, Hani Fakuri, our criminal law attorney, is not on the panel. Um, yeah, I mean, so just uh, in, in general on, on MC catchers, uh, I guess. If some of the question is how can you safely do research on MC ca catchers, uh, just uh, I guess point back to when uh, Kristen Paget demoed a MC catcher at uh, DEF CON a couple years ago. Uh, we were able to get to a circumstance where it could be uh, researched within a comfortable, uh, within the bounds of the law. There are many laws uh, about uh, using these kinds of devices. So if you're doing research on them, <coughs> it is definitely a good time to get some legal advice to make sure you're doing it in a safe manner. And I would also add that the current state is unknown. Um, the yeah. stuff that's actively being litigated, I think just in the past couple months, uh, Hany Fakori, our criminal defense, our point criminal defense guy, has filed amicus briefs on this because there's a large question as to the breadth of information and the breadth of CD, uh, call detail records and information that they're collecting on innocent people or on non-suspects. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the current state is, is cloudy um, and, you know, that's why we're here. We're here to file those amicus briefs and to make it less cloudy and clear for the judges. Um, actually, I'll, I'll spin on that a little bit. Uh, so this is going to get legal geeky uh, for just a sec. Um, 
In the American legal justice system, when law enforcement comes seeking a warrant, they usually go to magistrate judges, which are the lowest level of federal judges in, in the United States. They are not appointed for life, they're not full Article III judges, um, but they sign warrant applications. We've seen in the last year um, what's being referred to as a magistrate revolution. Uh, we've seen magistrates rejecting search warrant applications a lot, and it's great, and they are actively seeking uh, amicus participation from groups like EFF and ACLU. Um, and I think we need to see a lot more of that. Okay. I've got a, a pair of questions. One Speak on, up. I've got a pair of questions, one on the international side and one on the judicial side. So I'm both a U.S. and a U.K. citizen. Does that make me more or less uh, protected from U.S. and EU surveillance? So maybe I'm... <laughs> well, yeah. It's serious. So... Maybe one can say, oh, he's EU. Nah, if we can just take his stuff anyways. Uh, what happens there? And then secondly, on the judicial side, so for Riley, just as an example, um, whenever we see the government pushing very strange interpretations of what constitutes reasonable searches, is that consistent across the entire judicial department? Or are there any particular instances where they say, no, actually that's entirely reasonable, we're going to abandon trying to push some strange interpretation of what is a legal search? Thanks. Should I, I take the first half? I, I, a response to that first question is, who do you trust more, the NSA or GCHQ? <laughs> <laughs> but Eva has a proper answer, I assume. All right. Meanwhile, back in proper answer land. Um, <laughs> so uh, very often when you hear activism um, around opposing uh, illegal NSA surveillance, uh, you hear very sort of American-centric language, which is the NSA is spying on Americans, on American citizens, on, you know, blue-blooded whatever the hell. Um, and, and this is not okay. And the implication is that if you are not an American citizen, if you are, if, if you are not an American, you have no rights. You're left out in the cold. Screw you. Um, the NSA can spy on you all you want. Um, this is not true. This is not even remotely true. One of the reasons why you hear uh, so much rhetoric around uh, how terrible it is that the NSA is spying on Americans is because Americans are specifically outside of the NSA's remit. Um, so it is the most clear-cut case of the NSA breaking the law. But just because you are a non-US person does not mean that you don't have rights. And there are a couple of points, uh, very important points that um, EFF has been making uh, in this area. Uh, one of them is, in fact, our Ethiopia lawsuit, uh, where we are making the point that if you are a government and you want to spy on somebody in another country, you are still subject to the laws of that country. And this applies uh, in the United States and applies uh, when, um, when the U.S. government wants to spy in, in other countries as well. So we're trying to set that precedent. Um, EFF was also uh, instrumental in putting together um, a uh, set of principles, the 13 principles on the application of human rights to mass surveillance. And uh, hundreds of organizations all over the world have signed on to the principles, which uh, you can find at www.necessaryandproportionate.org, which is a very long and uh, awkward URL. Um, and, and one of the points that we make there is essentially that um, you are still protected by international law if you are a non-U.S. person. You still have privacy rights and that governments should um, only be using mass surveillance in a way that is necessary and proportionate to the task at hand. And what the NSA is doing right now, uh, we're arguing, is well outside of these, uh, of these uh, guidelines. Hello again. Um, how does the privacy law scale to space and other worlds? Okay. How does privacy law scale to space? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, there is a, a international treaty on uh, on space, uh, and it has some some rules about uh, weaponization of space and and so on. Uh, but I have not really examined it for how the privacy laws. Uh, but I would sure hope that uh, if we are uh, going to other worlds, to going to uh, outside of this one, that we maintain a society in the future that respects civil liberties wherever we go. 
<laughs> Hi. Uh, in the last five years, there's been a proliferation of on-officer video systems throughout the country. Uh, I on, was one on what? On-officer video systems, cameras the police officers wear on their oh, person. Yes, okay. So then when they go into somebody's home or into a business, by contrast of say a dash cam that's limited to the field of view in front of a vehicle or a CCTV on the inside or outside of a business, now law enforcement has the capacity to enter into a private residence or you know, at least some form of a private domicile. Um, does the EFF have a stance on you know, law enforcement wearing on officer video? Uh, and also what are kind of the restrictions about chain of custody and now that we have storage medias that can, or mediums that can basically store evidence indefinitely, are there any concerns applied to that as well? Um, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll hit on the, on the first question is that you know, no matter what technology the, the government is using, they need to use it within the bounds of the Constitution. So uh, if they have a camera on them inside of your house, they still need to have a warrant to go inside the house. And where this has actually come up most in, in the law has been places like using uh, heat imagers to look through walls and sort of getting that, that difference between something which you're doing outside of uh, a house and being able to see information that's inside that, that protected place. And so we want to make sure that all of these technologies are being used within the bounds of the Constitution and where they are seeing into a, a protected area, a place where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, that you are able to protect that reasonable expectation. Uh, and the, sort of the other, uh, I guess, uh, tension that, that comes in the areas of the law is new technologies are being used where uh, previously there were things that were very difficult for the police to do by uh, just this year, like, uh, challenge of having the, the, the number of officers necessary to do it. Uh, so this has come up in, in the cases of GPS uh, location versus you say, well, we could have an officer drive around, follow after somebody, and, and, but now we have this new technology that enables us to do that. Uh, and in that case, the Supreme Court said, you know, that the fact that you might be able to do it by having somebody go around, you couldn't, like, practically do that. And so this doesn't mean that it's always okay to use the technology to replicate that. So likewise, they might say that, you know, the difference between the, uh, the camera on, on an officer is that, is that it's, you know, they could remember everything that they saw, but we don't have the camera to be sure. But uh, on the whole, the real question is whether they can... Uh, go into a place that requires a warrant. If they come to your door, say, come back with a warrant, whether they have a camera or not. Thank you. Hi. I've got a two-parter on the like practical implications of a technology lawsuit. So when you work with tech all day, a lot of things could seem common sense and like there's just simple facts about how the system works, but to a layman in the court, it seems like complete, like uh, impenetrable to them. And I wondered if there was any way to think about when expert testimony would be required in a lawsuit. Expert testimony is almost never required uh, in a lawsuit. There are some, there's some very obscure areas where it is, it is required, but it's, th those are rare, and especially in criminal law, um, expert testimony is almost never required. That said, it's often extremely helpful, um, and the more the better. If, uh, if you are a technical expert and you're willing to testify for free in EFF cases, uh, email us. Huh. Info right. at EFF.org. So then, is it just a matter of like having a lawyer that's willing to understand the technology deep enough yep. to make the argument? Yep. And then my second part was, what are the implications on like winning a case if you do need a technical expert, and also on bankrupting the person that has to hire the technical expert. So, uh, sorry, what's that about the last part? Bankrupting? So like, yeah, if you, would it just be like an incredibly expensive ordeal that not an average person could hope to do? Yes. Well, I mean, we try and, that's one of the things that we try to resolve, by providing free legal services to people who otherwise could not afford to do a defense. If you actually have to pay for high quality lawyers who, uh, understand the, these technologies. There are a number of them out there. They'll charge five or six hundred dollars an hour. They're great, but most people can't afford that. And there are a number of circumstances where, where uh, it's been really satisfying to get into a case where the other side really thought they could come in there and just browbeat somebody, just blow them away because they have so much money and resources. 
and then be on their side and we're working for free and we get experts to come in to work for free and are able to match them toe to toe when they're trying to drive somebody uh, uh, under the ground uh, with the sheer weight of money and it's very satisfying when that doesn't work. In, uh, a, a, again, concrete example from the Ethiopia case, we have a whole stable of computer science PhDs from Citizen Lab, uh, from the University of California at Berkeley, from the University of Toronto Monk School, um, who are doing top-notch uh, computer forensics for us for free. And thanks, thanks, guys. First of all, I'd like to thank the EFF for all the good work that you guys do. And secondly, I have a big question for you in regards to LavaBit and the talks that occurred here at DEF CON from the founder of LavaBit. Uh, has EFF done anything or do you plan to do anything to try to address the legal issues that, constitutional issues really, that the founder of LavaBit faced? where he wasn't able to tell people his ordeal except the attorney that he was engaging and the fact that the government was aware of the fact that he was engaging certain people for legal advice and all of the issues surrounding it. So uh, yeah, we've been of course following the Lava Bed case very closely. We helped uh, uh, refer uh, Ladar to uh, a former EFFer, Marsha Hoffman, who uh, was able to help him out. Uh, as a, um, on the broader issues, um, one of the things we, we have been trying to do uh, with our national security letter case uh, is to uh, try and establish that uh, silence enforced by the, these, these orders where you can't tell somebody that you've received a national security letter is a, is a violation of the First Amendment. And so we're trying to get it so people can talk about the process that they've received uh, and can uh, be able to fight back against it more effectively. Uh, we, uh, we were very concerned about the case. We ended up filing an amicus brief because of the implications that were coming out from the notion that they could get the key to everybody. That, you know, in order to go after a particular target, you get the key that decrypts everybody's email, and that's far too broad. It is not targeted, and you have to then trust the government that they're not going to misuse that key. Um, so, unfortunately, that case did not go. Uh, the way that I thought it should have, uh, the way that I would have hoped, uh, but uh, we're still, you know, we're there for the next fight as well. Thank you. Hello. So a while ago, Europe decided that we had a right to be forgotten, <laughs> uh, and I think it was recently declared technically infeasible. Uh, I was just wondering if the EFF was involved in that and what your opinions were, if you can disclose them. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> So recently the uh, European Court of Justice made a terrible ruling regarding a gentleman in Spain who wanted to have uh, some information about his previous uh, legal dealings. I think the uh, sale of, of a home of his in a bankruptcy case uh, removed from Google search as part of an implementation of the right to be forgotten. And the European Court of Justice uh, moved that not only um, could they require Google to do so, but that they would start requiring Google to comply uh, with a variety of requests uh, from uh, people all over the European Union to uh, simply have things removed from, uh, from search if they simply didn't want them there anymore. Um, Google is actually not a big fan of this ruling because, <laughs> as you can imagine, having to hire a whole bunch of people to process all of these requests is an enormous pain in the ass. And it may seem easier to simply, you know, um, grant them all, but then you're engaged in this sort of mass censorship, uh, which we think is extremely problematic. So uh, one of the things that, uh, that we've been working with, uh, with Google and, and other search engines on is uh, we've, been talking about them, uh, we've been talking with them about what they can say about the things that they have removed uh, from their search engines in response to the right to be forgotten. And we're going to see if we can do some sort of analysis about um, what is being taken down, how it's being taken down, and why it is being taken down. Because we have a theory that um, when you grant people the right to censor content about themselves, um, that you're really only um, creating a, a tool for the powerful to groom their own image. 
but this is not really an argument that we can make without facts. And the European Court of Justice is actually struggling very hard to keep the search engines from being able to publish anything about what they're taking down, not just how many um, things they're taking down, but um, who they're taking down, them down in response to and why, because they feel that this will simply create a Streisand effect, where um, you have essentially done everything but tell them, you know, hey, here's where you find the information. Um, so there's, uh, there's a sort of struggle between, uh, between these two forces right now. Um, it is my hope that the European Court of Justice will come to understand that, uh, that this, this is simply not a feasible ruling, that it doesn't really protect anyone but people who are already powerful, and, uh, and I hope that they backtrack on it entirely. And this is something that EFF has really been working on in its international activism. One of the important things to remember about the right to be forgotten ruling uh, is that the, the Spanish gentleman at issue sued both Google and the publisher of the newspaper um, to get the article itself take it down, taken down, and the newspaper won. So the article still exists, but Google lost and it was de-indexed. Um, so it's not as bad as it could be. But I'm not sure that I would characterize it as not as bad as it could be. Um, I think that uh, one, of, one of the... Uh, it's awful. One of the lines from the ruling is essentially uh, we, we could not get the paper to take this down because that would clearly be illegal and so we are going after the search engine because we think that it would be easier to uh, sort of implement censorship in this way. And I think creating a new centralized form of censorship that is entirely up to very large search engines is a terrible idea. Yes. Yeah, just in case my thoughts were not clear on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, one of the um, best benefits of the ideal of electronic freedom that I can imagine as an American citizen would be to be able to go online on some government website and authenticate myself appropriately and see every database the government has that has my name in it. Not the contents in particular, because that would be, uh, my understanding would be, uh, be more like the Freedom of Information Act where you can request the contents of a document once you know that the document exists. But y there are situations where you don't even know that the government is tracking you. For instance, like on the no-fly list, which uh, my understanding is you don't have the right to even know that you're on it until you get your, a hand in your face at the airport saying you can't get on the plane. And more recently, the, like the, the secret list that the Veterans Administration had about and they were cooking the books on you know, how soon they were actually getting to patients and stuff like that. Um, is there anything uh, like that being um, tracked uh, as, as a form of electronic freedom? And do you know of any other secret lists that the government has that <laughs> the average, you know, that, that are being uh, tracked as an issue that the average conscientious lists. citizen might not you know, have heard of? Well, I guess, I mean, Thanks no. So. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I can answer a little bit about the, the list of lists is, is that actually a while back we did a Freedom of Information Act request yeah. to get from the, uh, the FBI at least uh, more information about some of their uh, databases. We were looking at the investigative data warehouse, uh, which was oh, yeah. their uh, attempt to sort of combine a bunch of these, these lists and together in one, one place. Uh, but it probably is going to be very difficult to get the full list of lists because they will often, uh, in, in Freedom of Information Act litigation, say that this information is secret and therefore cannot be uh, revealed. Um, you can uh, go and uh, FOIA yourself and try and get the records that uh, the government has about you, but the most interesting ones uh, probably will, they will not give you or even indicate that they, they have. Uh, Nate, do you yeah. want to expand on that? Yeah, just expand it. A little bit on that, and then Nate, if you want to talk. Um, I think it, when we're talking about lists and lists of lists, it, it depends on who you're asking, right? It, the domestic non-intelligence side, um, they at least publish, they being DHS, um, and this is not for kind of criminal investigations, like, you know, we know about the no-fly list because they have to publish um, the list they keep when they're collecting a system of records, right? They have to put out this, this notice. Now, the notice does not go into precise detail, um, but it does tell you the data they aim to collect, um, often retention periods, who they're sharing with, who they're <coughs> going to share it with, um, more information like that. So, you know, kind of the, 
the crazy lists at the DHS we know about. It's really this, the intelligence list because it goes beyond um, the Privacy Act, which mandates DHS to do those lists. It goes beyond just the FOIA, um, the Freedom of Information Act request, where we, they have a lot of the well, the information we found out right from Snowden and from the leaks. Um, and so that's kind of you know my answer. You have to separate it out. Uh, we are going to know probably a lot of these civilian agency lists. Um, we will probably not know a lot about the intelligence agency lists um, unless you know courage becomes contagious and there are more whistleblowers out there. Um, and the criminal investigatory lists, right? We, we may know some of them, but there is always going to be some hidden list, and I think that kind of sums up you know the nuance of how we approach these things and how we approach what information the government is collecting. Hi. Uh, my question actually dovetails with what we were just saying. Given what is apparently an increasing trend of aggressively prosecuting uh, federal leakers, is the process for protecting federal whistleblowers broken? Can it be fixed? And what are the implications for all of our, uh, for the next potential Snowden? It's totally broken. It is totally yeah. broken. Completely <laughs> broken. Um, and it's broken, I mean, it's broken in particular on the, I'll answer what I can and then you guys can jump in. I mean, it is particularly broken on the intelligence side. Um, you know, we have seen all, the, all of the leakers, you know, you know Wick, Rick Wiebe, Thomas Drake, you can't go up through, you are forced to go up through a system that, at least from the, the history and the evidence we have, is intended to and does neglect warnings from lower individuals. Um, people have warned their managers. Um, you know, we have Thomas Drake saying and Snowden saying that he warned these managers and what happens is they don't listen. Um, and that is a huge problem. Um, then on the other side of that you have the congressional intelligence committees who are supposed to be overseeing these things um, and who are supposed to be ensuring that uh, whistleblowers and leakers can go to them. Um, but again, we see that not happening and that doesn't happen because the system is broken. Um, there are few, if any, protections. I believe there are even no protections. Um, yeah, uh, there, there, there are protections for whistleblowers uh, on the books. They're just not strong enough. Uh, that they're, they're basically designed to allow people to speak to the government inspector general uh, about uh, problems that they're seeing or, or, or sort of make a complaint to the government. Uh, and sometimes there's the concern that those complaints will not be acted upon. And so sometimes the whistleblowers are not satisfied with internally whistleblowing. Um, there's a really great site, whistleblowers.org, that, that actually discusses what protections are out there. Uh, so there are some, but it's just not enough to, to give a real assurance to somebody who wants to blow the whistle and will be able to do so. Uh, both the, with protections and effectively. And unfortunately a lot of the protections uh, to, to whistleblowers apply only to federal government employees and do not extend to contractors. Um, Snowden obviously was a contractor, not a federal government employee, so a lot of the whistleblower protections that are on the books for employees didn't even apply to him. And last of all, if you think things look grim for whistleblowing and reporting on whistleblowing in the United States, try Australia, our partner in the Five Eyes, uh, which is uh, currently considering legislation that would essentially um, make it illegal to report on uh, documents which uh, have come to light uh, on, on the subject of, uh, of national security in Australia if they are made public by leakers. And that's an attack not just on leakers but on journalism itself. Is there anything we can do to fix it? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, cer certainly there are, there are things to try. And one of, one of the things is that uh, there is uh, one uh, on the journalism front here, here in the United States, there's a really good case called Bart Nicky, uh, which is addressing a, a circumstance in which a radio station got some information that was unlawfully obtained. They published it on the radio. People went after them and uh, for, for publishing that and went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said because that information came to them through no fault of their own, that they had a First Amendment right to put that news out there. And so uh, uh, we haven't seen uh, a lot of cases in which after the information has been received by uh, newspapers and reporters where they brought cases against the newspapers and reporters. So that's been helpful. Um, and then for some of the uh, uh, well, suggestions that have been made is that the uh, Espionage Act could be used against whistleblowers. I think that if that actually was brought before a court, uh, it would be a hard case for the government to win. 
Uh, the, the threat of it out there may discourage people, but this is a, a 1918 uh, law that you know was passed during World War I. Uh, it's fairly uh, a draconian, uh, and it hasn't really been used, uh, but its threat is there. And I'm hopeful that if it ever does get through, if they pull the trigger on that, that uh, you know ourselves or someone else who's, who's fighting on that case can establish that that is, a, that is a bunk law and take that threat away. Thank you. The other, the, the, so there's another side to this, of course, which is um, there are technical protection measures that whistleblowers can use to protect themselves. And the, the, the one that I'm going to plug is SecureDrop. Uh, SecureDrop is maintained by the Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is uh, a, a friend and client of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, and allows uh, what we think is probably a secure way for whistleblowers to talk to uh, journalists in a way that uh, they will not be able to be identified later. So, yay, secure drop. Yeah, you any, uh, yeah so, so I, I actually work on um, secure drop and have since the last uh, like major re release of it. Um, so, we, we, you know, secure drop is based on a Tor browser bundle currently, right? So, all, all the caveats of browser attack surface, all the caveats of attacks against Tor, Tor hidden services, and so forth apply to secure drop. So, um, make of that what you will, <laughs> right? But there are people who are, there are like more people now thinking about how to protect whistleblowers and journalists um, because they realize this is a really important problem. Like we've heard of this thing called invisible.im that some people just came up with. So um, yeah, there's, it's, there's more technology out there, but you know, like given an adversary like the NSA, you have to be really careful about the claims you make about security. So you mentioned earlier um, about community Wi-Fi. Uh, my question in regards to that is how does community Wi-Fi and municipal fiber affect net neutrality? And how can one like myself combat the vast amounts of misinformation surrounding those subjects? Sure, sorry, a little hard for me to hear you were asking about municipal Wi-Fi. Yeah, community Wi-Fi and municipal fiber and how do they affect net neutrality? And then what can I do to combat the misinformation or any of us do? All right. So on, on municipal Wi-Fi, I mean, so we have an open wireless project uh, that we are promoting. Uh, part of it is actually uh, here. We have we re recently released some software for a router based on OpenWRT. We're trying to make it both uh, more secure and also uh, to have it easier to have a segregated guest network so people can open their wireless and help uh, uh, basically be a good neighbor and allow people to get on the internet through their connection while not compromising ourselves. Another uh, aspect of, of this is uh, in order, a lot, of, a lot of municipalities are either making muni Wi-Fi where they're having free Wi-Fi for all the citizens of their community, or in some cases they'll have municipal fiber which they will make available to people who want to use it. Uh, and so uh, they're sort of like let a thousand flowers bloom using, using this municipal uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, and th if this means that people will have uh, alternative ways of getting onto the internet where uh, they can just go uh, through their, through their uh, city or through a, a neighbor who is running open wireless, uh, then this can help uh, uh, bring them out. Uh, you, know, so you don't have to go through the major providers who uh, have been talking a lot about uh, uh, being unneutral and throttling different types of, uh, or making a fast lane depending on how you look at it. Uh, for, for various types of uh, access to websites. Uh, so by providing a alternative path for people to get on the web, that may be helpful in making sure that folks can get to the stuff that they want to see uh, without having to go through a major ISP. Thanks. Hi, I, uh, I know we briefly talked about uh, gag orders and I was curious of your opinion on warrant canaries, um, that being a canary that dies in the mine to say that it's, it's now unsafe to be there. Um, along the lines of, you know, Google or someone hosting a page that they update manually every week or so saying, no, we haven't received a, a, a warrant or a gag order. And then, you know, can, can the government actually tell them to not take this down and to to, to lie to uh, withhold this gag order? So warrant canaries um, are, are fascinating. Uh, and <laughs> I actually wrote an FAQ about warrant canaries, so you can look at that on our blog for really a deep drill down. But I'll sort of go over uh, briefly. 
that this has not been litigated. We don't have a court that has said one way or the other about how it would work with warrant canaries. Um, and you're exactly right about what the issue is bring is compelled speech. Courts have dealt with compelled speech before. And in a few instances, you, you can compel someone to speak, like, you know, uh, warning labels uh, are a form of compelled speech. So that's why they're, they, you know, the, the cigarette companies don't want to have warnings on their packs, but nevertheless, they're compelled to do so. Most compelled speech circumstances have been in commercial speech. And a warrant canary would be a circumstance where it is put there for political reasons. And by and large, when it is compelled political speech, courts have not been friendly to this. So uh, I think there's some pretty good arguments that uh, the, the government shouldn't be able to compel you to lie. Uh, nevertheless, these haven't been tested. And one of the things that, that uh, uh, we'll see if one of these cases come up, uh, you know, please do get in touch with us uh, because we, we'd be very interested in that type of case. Ideally, it would be a circumstance in which the canary, uh, the event will not occur for some time so that we can have uh, a full briefing schedule with the court and the court can look at it in sort of a calm and measured manner, which is sort of, uh, courts, if they're gonna do something bold and radical, they need to do it in a calm and measured way. <laughs> uh, so if, uh, you know, if this is gonna go live tomorrow and the, and the government is saying there'll be blood on your hands and we have a giant emergency here, then, then most likely the court is gonna say, okay, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I don't understand this well enough to do something bold and to, to disagree with the government who's telling me that the, the world will end. Uh, but if we're able to, to go through it, explain these, you're going to write a good brief that explains uh, compelled speech law and how it applies here, uh, we're hopeful for the best. Hi, uh, thank you for your work, first of all. Um, my thank question you. is regarding the um, topic of privacy and identities. And I wanted to get your in identity on online identities. Online events. Identities. Identities. Ident Sorry. Um, just want to get your opinion on government programs that deal with these issues, such as the National Strategy for Trusted Identities, Cyberspace Instic. Can you repeat the latter half of the question? Or just speak. Which. Is this better? Yes, yes much, much better. better. <laughs> All right, sorry, first time on a mic. Uh, your opinion on programs um, that deal with trusted identities in cyberspace, such as INSTIC, which I just used the acronym. It suggests what? Is INSTIC National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace? Uh, oh. Uh, just wanted to get your opinion on programs like that. Um, I, I know that, that some of my colleagues have been looking into that, but I don't know if any, anyone on this panel has. I got nothing. Uh, Li Tian will be able to answer your question another time. <laughs> he's really great, so he's probably doing good, wonderful things on it, but I just don't happen to know what they are. Hi. Uh, so it's been an interesting year already for uh, Supreme Court cases. Um, uh, we've, you've already talked about a couple of them. There was also the one having to do with uh, retransmission of over the air television broadcasts. Area. Area. Area, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on that uh, and if you could comment on any upcoming Supreme Court cases that you're uh, involved with or tracking. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll answer the, the Aereo uh, question. Uh, so Aereo, as many of you may know, it was a company that was uh, uh, selling a, a service where you could uh, basically have an antenna, uh, individual antenna, so they had thousands of these dime-sized antenna. You, each customer would have one. It would get broadcast from initially New York and, and eventually some other areas. Uh, and then for uh, residents of those areas, they could watch over the internet a stream that was generated from that antenna. Um, and we looked at that in that case and looked at the law and it really seemed like that that was a circumstance in which uh, they were not doing a, a, a public performance under the Copyright Act. They were doing something that was basically an extended antenna. It was an innovative way of doing something that, uh, that was not prohibited by the Copyright Act under the language of the act as, as drafted. Uh, and so what we, we wrote an amicus brief in that case and tried to explain to the court that, uh, uh, you know, some people were saying basically it's taking advantage of a loophole. This is not, you know, what, what we want to have here. And that it's not the court's place to, to make these sorts of decisions. To, in order to preserve innovation, people have to innovate within the law that exists. 
and they look at the law that exists and they, they find that there is an area where the Copyright Act is not prohibiting it, they should be able to do that unless Congress comes in and changes the law to, to, uh, to make those changes. But nevertheless, unfortunately, uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, did come out against uh, Aereo's business model. They said they were kind of more or less like a cable company, and so therefore they should be treated like a cable company. Uh, and, uh, well, Aereo ended up uh, losing on that argument. Do, do you think that has any uh, other implications for other companies outside of that kind of yeah. decision? Well, so the, the court in, in writing this decision took some pains to say, you know, we are, we are not doing anything that's going to be bad for the cloud. They were very worried about the effect of this case on the cloud. Uh, I, they, the, the word cloud came up a lot uh, in the oral argument there. Um, and so I, I hope that when other judges are looking at this decision and they have the uh, uh, content industry saying, this decision means that uh, something else that is innovative is also bad, that those courts will look at, the, uh, at that language, that limiting language, and say, okay, we should limit this really to, to these specific facts, but certainly the, the recording industry is going to try uh, and, and expand it as best they can, and so we're going to try and limit it as best we can. Thank you very much. If you want a, a little piece of, of legal geekery, our colleague Parker Higgins did a, a, a cut of all of the uses of the word cloud in that oral argument, and he, he put it on SoundCloud. So if you Google Parker Higgins Supreme Court cloud, it's masterful. Hi. Have uh, you or any of your uh, associates suffered any of the theoretical consequences of your affiliations, be it um, increased surveillance, um, selective prosecution or anything that would be considered heat? And uh, if not, do you at least feel like you're walking on eggshells? Uh, Harvey Silverglate's book talks about the average American um, breaking th uh, th three federal laws a day. Um, I guess that wouldn't really be an option for you guys, I would think. So, uh, and also I'm, I'm not uh, um, limiting the scope to just governmental type heat, but any uh, organizations that would consider you adversarial. So, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I guess we, we, we don't, if anyone wants to add to this, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, you know, we, we are within three hops of people that they're interested in, so like under the terms or, of, of the program, that it probably uh, means they're looking at our phone records and such, but I mean, we're all under surveillance uh, uh, under the program. Whether it has been uh, directed heat, I mean, I, you know, I don't think any of us have been selectively prosecuted. Um, you know, it, it, I would hope that uh, even, even if they are looking deeply uh, at us, that uh, you know they would think that if they actually decided to do something sort of discriminatory, uh, that they'd realize that'd be a bit of news and uh, that uh, you know uh, uh, they wouldn't want to create martyrs. But I guess we'll find out if they do. <laughs> Uh, for the U.S. government, uh, detaining employees of the Electronic Frontier Foundation is incredibly mediapathic. Um, <laughs> that provides us with a tiny bit of protection. Um, my threat model, on the other hand, because I do international work and I spend a lot of time working with um, journalists and activists who are under threat uh, in other countries, is, uh, my threat model is mostly non-U.S. government. And uh, probably the funniest sort of heat that I have uh, I've ever seen come my way uh, was the time that the Vietnamese government sent me malware. And <laughs> <laughs> I do all of EFF's malware analysis reports. <laughs> Free advertising. So it couldn't, they couldn't have sent it to a, a more appropriate person. Um, if it had come to somewhere else, um, our, uh, our intake coordinator would have just wound up sending it to me. Um, so I, I got together with uh, Morgan Marquis-Boire from Citizen Lab and we wrote up the contents of the malware. <laughs> but what was particularly interesting about this malware, aside from the fact that it would not have worked on my machine in the first place, was um, the targeting. The, it was, uh, the malware was made to look like an email from a gentleman at Oxfam offering uh, me an invitation to a conference in Asia. And this showed a, a tremendous understanding of what interests activists, which is free conferences. <laughs> if they had really wanted me to open the document, they should have offered free flights and hotels. Yeah, 
Bu- business class travel would have done it, I think. Oh, man, I would have yeah. been owned. I, I wanted to add to what Kurt said about canaries and say that the courts are much more liberal when it comes to restraining you action. A closer to the mic? Sorry, I was going to add to what you were saying about canaries, that the courts tend to be much more liberal about restraining action than compelling it. So if the canary is automated or already up, um, they can restrain you from modifying it much e- or much more willing to do that than they would be to compel you to continue to take a manual action. But my question really goes to what you said earlier about infrared cameras peeking inside homes using heat sensitivity. And it goes to technology and the reasonable expectation of privacy. And the question is, does encryption create a reasonable expectation of privacy, particularly vis-a-vis Smith v. Maryland? Uh, so we're talking about Smith v. Maryland, for those who are not familiar with it, that is the, the sort of uh, origin case of the third party doctrine, this notion that if you, if you put your information uh, online that you are no longer having uh, an expectation of privacy in it, so it's open season uh, on that information. This is one of the things that we're trying to, uh, to uh, undercut that doctrine and make it uh, make sense uh, in, in a modern age. Uh, on, on encryption, I mean, I think one of the, the areas where this has come up uh, has been on uh, forced uh, decryption. Uh, and so there's a little bit of, a, I think, of a different question because, I mean, if your encryption is, is good, then the question of whether you uh, have a reasonable expectation of privacy isn't going to come up so much as uh, can, they, can they get at it um, and they'll need to get a password. Uh, and the question is, can they require you to, uh, to give up that password? So it usually comes up in a Fifth Amendment context. Or a key. Or a key. Or, yeah. So um, while you do have a, a Fifth Amendment right uh, and to, to not give up uh, your, your password, sometimes this can be undercut by the inevitable disclosure doctrine. Uh, and so what this means is that if uh, they, they are able to convince the court that that information would have come up anyway because they know what's in there, uh, then uh, they, can, they can require you to decrypt it. So they can't compel you to give up your password, they can require you to decrypt the information, which is, which is the same. But if decrypting the information would show that this is your information, it would be a testimonial act because it would give them new data that you actually had control over this, uh, then that, that starts to be strong, more strongly protected uh, by the Fifth Amendment. There's only been a handful of cases on this. Um, and so, while well, we're going to continue to, to work on those fights and, and to push against uh, forced decryption. Uh, and we really have not had one which has put decryption or encryption into directly in the third party doctrine. So we'll look forward for when that case comes up before the courts. I think an import- another important point here, though, is uh, I would argue very strongly, and I have, that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your communications, even if they're not encrypted. So, a- Absolutely. In fact, that's a, a case that, that we uh, were successful with in uh, the Sixth Circuit, uh, where the court found that there was a reasonable expectation of privacy in email, uh, even if it wasn't encrypted, regardless of whether it was encrypted and required a warrant to get that email. Uh, and one of the things we did with the who has your back report that Nate was talking about earlier is we asked all these service providers, uh, do they insist upon a warrant before they give up content? Uh, and you can look at that report, see where the gold stars are. But basically we're asking them to say that they agreed with that Sixth Circuit decision and would apply it regardless of what circuit they were in. I was concerned that my question may have actually just been pulled out from under me by the previous questioner. (laughs) Um, But it looks like it veered in a different direction. So my question was, can you speak to third party doctrine in the context of um, data that is encrypted before leaving your system and being stored in cloud? In other words, a true crypt file stored on Dropbox, that sort of thing. And without veering into the Fifth Amendment side of it, which I know is a separate discussion, um, by doing those two actions together, are you uh, automatically going to fall under third-party doctrine even though um, the, the data was encrypted before it left your system? Well, so uh, I guess to, to uh, echo a little bit of what, what Nate was just saying is actually you know, what we've been pushing for is 
to require warrants before you get that information, regardless of whether it's encrypted. That this notion that you've given up your privacy rights by taking advantage of uh, online services where you're storing your information elsewhere is an antiquated and outdated notion that you should be able to take full advantage of modern technologies without giving up your civil liberties. So, Now you can add to that by giving yourself some technical protections by using encryption both in the communication and, and storing it there. Um, and, and this can be helpful to add an extra layer of technical protection against that, that principle. And to, to what gives me a lot of hope on this front is the Riley decision. The Riley decision we talked about earlier, this was a cell phone decision. And one of the things that they talked about was why you needed a warrant there was in part because if you got onto somebody's phone, you might be able to access information that they held elsewhere. And if you sort of think about that, if they believed that the third party doctrine made all of that you know, pointless, you didn't need a warrant, you know, once you put it on the server, doesn't matter, there's no need to say that in the opinion. So it, it suggested that when they were looking at the phones, looking at the capabilities of the phones to be able to get that information off of the Dropbox or wherever, that this was something that, that brought a warrant to their mind. So hopefully we will get a, a good case on this, uh, more good cases to establish that a warrant is needed for any of this information, whether it's encrypted or not. But sure, you might as well also add that extra layer of protection by putting encryption on any of the materials you're storing elsewhere. Thanks for everything. The files that allowed for the 3D printing of firearms were ordered taken down. Could you discuss the law around that? So the, the question was about the 3D printer and, and the firearms, and uh, I don't know if anybody on this panel has, has worked on that one. Um, that case is in progress. All right. That's the best answer I can give. Sure. I'm curious about um, if in your international work you've run into the situations where a foreign government is using the U.S. court to suppress uh, free speech from bloggers, uh, and online newspapers, you know, from, uh, from dissidents from their government. There's a, a, a recent pattern recently. The Haitian government has been using defamation laws in the U.S. to silence by uh, opening multiple uh, uh, lawsuits against bloggers in online newspapers. I'm wondering if you've encountered that strategy from other governments or it, and if that's something that you guys would be interested in looking into. Well, it turns out that there's an incredible variety of, uh, of tactics that governments use to uh, silence speech all over the world, especially speech which is um, taking part on platforms that they do not directly control. Um, sort of third-party platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr uh, and, uh, and Blogger are tremendously dangerous uh, to governments that want to maintain strict control over their media. And frequently these, um, these platforms become the sort of one place where you can get independent media in certain countries. Um, probably the best example of that that I can think of off the top of my head uh, is Ethiopia, because I have spent a lot of time working with Ethiopian activists. Um, We've seen a couple of different tactics for shutting down speech. Uh, probably the most common one that involves a sort of US law is to simply file uh, DMCA takedowns against speech that the government do uh, doesn't like. And this is a very common abuse of the DMCA. And this is uh, sort of the basis of, of one of our uh, main protests against the DMCA. Because um, the way that the DMCA, DMCA works is that a, a, a person who is complaining can actually get content taken down merely by alleging that the content is, uh, is theirs, that it is, um, and that it is an abuse of their copyright. And it is up to the person who has put the content up in the first place to file a, uh, a counter notice if they want the content to be put back up. And in doing so, they both have to reveal um, information about themselves and also open themselves up to the possibility of, uh, of a lawsuit. 
And so often they are, uh, even if they know that they can do this, they're scared to do so. Sometimes the content is also time sensitive. And so by the time uh, they have filed the counter notice and put the content back up, it's, uh, it's already too late. So we've, uh, we've seen this approach. We've also seen um, abuses of the abuse reporting system. For example, I worked with um, activists at uh, Viet Tan, which is a sort of pro-democracy opposition group um, mostly located in Vietnam um, that was having a bunch of their Facebook uh, sites taken down. So many members of Vietnam were losing um, access to their Facebook accounts and this is where they were doing most of their activism. And it turned out that uh, supporters of the Vietnamese government had figured out that the one way you can shut down somebody's Facebook account very quickly is simply by reporting that the user is underage. So this is a, sort of a, a, another uh, abuse of the, of the abuse system rather than abuse of the court system. And one of the things that EFF finds extremely worrying is that uh, these third party platforms like Facebook and Tumblr and Twitter have become sort of the, the semi-public commons. And um, often you don't have to go through the courts anymore, you don't have to go through, uh, through any kind of legal rigmarole if you want to uh, suppress speech, all you need to do is, uh, is game the system that, uh, that these platforms put up in order to decide what content stays up and what stays down. And uh, in order to sort of fight this, um, EFF has just received a grant from the Knight Foundation to uh, run a site that we're calling OnlineCensorship.org. Um, I think that uh, the first version of it is already up and it's a place where people can um, report uh, things that have been taken down from, um, on, on these sites, usually for TOS violations. And this gives us some insight into uh, how these, uh, these services are taking content down and whether or not there is bias in the kind of content that they're taking down and whether or not there are sort of campaigns to get certain types of content taken down, uh, which is something that we really don't know anything about right now. Thank you. We only have a couple answer. minutes left for questions. Only about two minutes two left minutes? for more questions. Two minutes, all right. So we'll take these last two questions and so right. in there. jump into it. As like we use technology more in our like civilization and I assume technology related questions like the DMCA and like uh, maybe a keylogger in a divorce or something, those are all like penetrating the courts across the country and just boring non-precedent setting cases. And I wondered if you guys have any like insight into how much or how often these technology issues are coming up just in random cases that don't make the news and if you think our like courts and the random lawyers across the country are like up to it or like what's the situation with all that? Okay, well, so uh, we, we get a little bit of insight into that because uh, our, our intake system receives a lot of requests where they may not be precedent setting that we end up referring them to other people, but at least it gives us a, a sense of what's out there. We try to refer people as, uh, you know, to qualified counsel so they can, they can fight on these issues. There's probably a lot more people out there who don't know about the EFF, who uh, might be in this situation and don't know to contact us. So, you know, if you hear about people who are in a situation where they should contact us, pass on, pass on the good word. Uh, but yeah, I think the technology, um, is coming into many, many cases. I mean, a number of years ago, uh, it was, uh, uh, people would go to the courts with a subpoena to try to identify an online speaker. And we were involved in a lot of uh, litigation around that uh, to try and establish what the test is for revealing the identity of an online speaker. Uh, now we will occasionally get involved in those cases where it's going to be a chance to improve that test or uh, find that test in a new jurisdiction, but in many, many cases all across the country, people are using that and, and applying those tests to either identify or not identify somebody. Cool. All right. Last Thanks. question. Okay, so if people want to use software, they have to click something that says, yes, I've read this document and I agree to all the terms. So although people technically have agreed to it, um, they probably aren't aware that every single thing they type into the address bar of Chrome is going back to Google and they probably haven't even begun to think about how Nest is going to affect what Google now knows about them. You guys have the who has your back report for encryption 
Do, are any plans to put up a similar report for who isn't asking you to give out copious amounts of your privacy or calling out the ones who do? That's a good question. Um, we don't have any plans to do that right now. Uh, we are pretty slammed bandwidth wise. Okay. Um, but it's great. You should do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you so much. The support from this community has always been very important to us. We love you all. And it's so great to be here once again to answer your questions. Uh, so thank you guys. <laughs>